century, bears roamed the British countryside. They were dangerous beasts and would quite cheerfully maul people to death. The wild boar was another feared animal, capable of the odd disembowelment. By the 17th century, both species had been hunted to extinction. Today, with its pretty villages and ordered patchwork of fields, we like to think of the British countryside as a safe and gentle place. But could it be that a wild and savage beast still stalks the dales of Durham? They're locking up with extra care in Durham these days since a mystery visitor first began to disturb their peace. It happened so quick as I went up to it. It stood up, turned out and went into the hedgerow. I mean, it was very early, there was no other traffic about. It was, that's exactly what it is. Just got up, turned out and went. As a local farmer, Heather Allenson knows the usual animals of the region well, but this, she says, was something different. We have dogs and cats on the farm, obviously, and animals. We see deers, badgers, and it was nothing I've ever seen before. What struck me about it was its very shiny, glossy head, its features. It had big, bright eyes, and just the power of it as it got up and went. We've had about 180 sightings to date. Some of them have been very, very good sightings, sightings by doctors of biology, by countrymen, who you would expect to be able to recognise anything that you see in a countryside. Sergeant Eddie Bell is Durham Police's wildlife officer. He's been on the case of the mystery sightings since they began over 10 years ago. Mobile phone, she's up at the okay. age 68. There's been a fox cub knocked down and it's injured was something different to what people would normally see or, or they wouldn't have reported it. But we, we hadn't a clue really what it, it could have been. It was, I suppose, mystical really. One of the earliest sightings was made by lorry driver Robert Davis. His encounter happened at Fishburn Cokeworks in 1986. It looked about five to six feet, maybe it's a bit less. It was sandy coloured. And it had a dark sort of like front, maybe it's off the coke dust. And it, it just walked light. Fishburn Coke Works, now closed, provided Eddie Bell with the first clue as to the identity of his quarry. It appeared that the beast had jumped a 10 foot coke heap in one bound as it hunted for prey. On the top was a number of dead seagulls that had been uh, hunted and eaten. So whatever it was, was big and, and very powerful and very athletic. It was, I think, the last place on earth you would expect to find any sort of wild animal. Bell discovered a network of tunnels on the site where he suspected the beast might have its lair. Going into an animal's den is, is uh, obviously very frightening, especially when you don't know what's there. was perhaps four feet square running maybe 20, 25 yards back. And it really was dark and a bit like going potholding. I was going in the only way in or out. And if anything was at the other end, the only way out was to come past me. So it, it was a little bit worrying. Bell's courage paid off. In the dust lining the tunnel floor, he found the tracks of a large animal. They were big enough that you would think, well, I hope there's nothing at the end of this tunnel if I go in to have a look around. These are the actual prints found by Bell in 1986, but he had to wait seven years for the next hard evidence of the beast stalking Durham. In September 1993, the village of Walton had an unwelcome visitor, and this time it was after bigger prey. We were in bed, it was about half past one in the morning not quite asleep, as, you know, and the security lights came on. So I immediately had a look out of the window and stayed there for two or three minutes and 
couldn't see anything. The dogs weren't barking, so I thought there's nothing really untoward, so went back to bed. One of the three-quarter grown lambs in the paddock next door had been very effectively slaughtered and just about wholly eaten. This was not the kind of sheep kill local farmers had ever seen before. There was no sign of any blood on the, on the grass. And I thought it was a bit, a bit strange because I'd never seen a sheep worried before in them circumstances. Usually there's a lot of blood about, and, but in this case there wasn't any. I've seen plenty of dog worry and having worked as a policeman in a, a sheep area for a long time and it was completely different to any of the dog worryings I've ever been to. But this time the beast had left behind a series of clues to its identity. First, there was the sheep's carcass. It was a very, very clean kill. There was no sign of blood. There was no chewed bones. Um, there was actually um, sort of raspings of flesh on the fleece as if something like a cat had licked the, the meat from the, the the actual animal next came an unusual paw print found on the edge of the village this was examined by scenes of crime officer ian wilkinson it was a fairly big print which was unusual for this area and the actual print that was made in the soil was quite firm it was quite noticeable so that struck me um, straight off. Wilkinson took this cast of the print. It was clear from this that they were dealing with a big cat, something approaching the size of a lion. Finally, there were the droppings found beside the carcass. These were sent to an expert for analysis. It was actually positively identified as the dropping of, of a large cat. Um, the exact words were, which I'll never forget, were had I found it on the Serengeti, I would have said it was uh, from a leopard, but I would suspect that it's actually from something like a puma. The cast made by Ian Wilkinson was checked against this one, taken from a puma in a zoo. They were a close match. The puma lives in a very, very wide variety of habitats, ranging from high mountains down to rainforests and dry deserts. There's absolutely no reason that such a superbly adaptive animal couldn't exist in moorland and whatever we have to offer here in Durham. But if a puma could survive in the British countryside, how did it get there in the first place? Today there are strict controls on the ownership of exotic pets, but this wasn't always the case. You could phone up Harrods and order a panther or an anaconda to keep as a pet, as long as you had the money to pay for it. But in 1976, the Wild Animals Act came into force, and that required the keeping of animals under much more secure conditions. And rather than have their pets put down or transfer them to a zoo, it's likely that they actually release them into the wild. There is no official acknowledgement of the Durham Puma. The carcass from the Walton sheep kill was sent to the Ministry of Agriculture for post-mortem. But even as a police officer, Eddie Bell was not allowed to see the Ministry's report. But Eddie Bell doesn't need the Ministry's say-so. He's got the evidence of his own eyes. It was Christmas Eve, um, which is why I remember it. I was due back at work at two. I was coming home, it was a very frosty night. I was fairly tired. I was looking forward to getting home because I was frozen stiff and I was about two miles from home and ahead of me in the headlights I actually saw the reflected eyes of an animal. What's that? What is it? It's not a deer. It can't be a fox. And as I came up on it and I got a better view in the headlights it, it was a puma sat at the roadside. It's a cat. I stopped maybe five yards past it and I got out the car and it was still at the roadside, although by then it had realised I'd stopped and it had got up and it had started off away from me and it went through a hedge and across a ploughed field. Um, and I, I watched it go and I, I really felt I wanted to go after it. But there was nothing I could do. I had no camera, no torch. 
um, nothing to record it with and, and at the end of the day there was nothing I could have done even if I'd caught it. So I marked the position where I saw it with a, a, a stick and I continued home and I went to bed. And I remember waking up and thinking, I've just had the strangest dream, I must have been really tired. And then it, I thought, no, it wasn't a dream, I, I did see what I saw. And I got in the car and I went straight back down the hill and there was the stick where I'd left it. And I knew then that I hadn't actually dreamt it, I had actually seen a puma. Pumas live for around 15 years. The first sighting was reported in 1986, so if there is one at large, it might not be around for much longer, and the sighting should stop soon. Unless, of course, there's a pair of them breeding out there. Good night. <laughs>